Um, I had the, the great privilege to meet my wife while she was in medical school. Um, and one of the things I learned while dating a med student was that the lab, the white lab coat, right, it had meaning. I don't know if it's still true, but in the early to mid-90s, the length of that white lab coat, you know what I'm talking around, you're at the hospital, you see people with the lab coats on, but back in the mid to late 90s, um, the length of the lab coat mattered. If you had a lab coat that went down to the knees or mid-thigh, that mean you had a, means you had initials under your, after your name, MD. That meant that you were a doctor, that the longer the coat, the more prestigious you were. Now, if you had a, a waist-level white lab coat, you're just a medical student. You don't know what you're doing. You, you don't know what you're doing. I, let me tell you, when a medical student graduates and they get to take off that short little coat and put on that, that long lab white coat, that means something to those medical students. I, uh, I was in high school on the basketball team. I'm not going to tell you what year, but I remember when we got uh, some new uniforms, and I was right in that transition period between, you know, shorts about right here, kind of upper thigh basketball shorts that were, I'll be honest, inappropriate, <laughs> right? We got new uniforms, and then we got those long, hip, cool the ones, the shorts that went down to the knees. I, can't, I tell you what, we could not wait as a team to get off those little, those little Daisy Duke shorts and put on those long hooping shorts that we'd finally been given. There's something about taking off the old and putting on the new. There's something to removing the old and putting on the new. It, it, it has a lot of meaning. It meant a lot to my wife and her classmates at Baylor College of Medicine. It meant a lot to me and my teammates at Stratford Senior High School. And I think we're going to find out that it means a lot to the Apostle Paul and to a church that he is writing in the town of Ephesus. Open up your Bibles, grab your Bible journals, open up your smartphone, pull open your Bible app, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 17 to 32 this morning. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul wrote... Um, to the Ephesian followers of Jesus, and, and that they are in Christ, and that should result in their worship of God, the triune God. And then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, the second half of the book of Ephesians, we see how that position of being in Christ, how that should reshape how the Christian Ephesians and how we should live our lives. In Ephesians, we see the gospel story and how it reshapes our story. Last week, we saw that because Followers of Jesus, because we're, because we're in Christ, there's this picture of a deepening fellowship set between us, right? An eagerness to maintain unity and celebrate and use the God-given diversity of gifts that, that God has given us. And by doing so, we grow in our maturity. The result of the church's unity and diversity is the church's maturity. The small letter written by the Apostle Paul, it challenges followers of Jesus to not just know a list of facts, to not just win Bible trivia about Jesus, but to actually know and allow Jesus to reshape who we are. Let's jump in. Chapter 4, verses 17, 18, and 19 to begin with. Now this I, Paul, so this is Paul, now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. A little recap from last week. Remember when we, when we encounter the word walk, that means to conduct our life. So when Paul tells us to walk a certain way, we're to conduct our life a certain way. And, and when you see the word you, Y-O-U, it really, it's, it's plural. It's always plural in Ephesians. So you can just separate it. Some of you love it. Instead of you, you can just say y'all, right? And the Gentiles is the word that Paul uses to identify those that don't follow Jesus. So in essence, our first verse this morning says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that y'all must no longer conduct your life as those who don't follow Jesus do. Paul continues to shoot straight. He is a straight shooter, and he continues to do that with us here saying, as a new community, a new creation redeemed, bought, and saved by the blood 
of Jesus Christ, we're no longer to walk, we're no longer to conduct our lives as the Gentiles do, as followers, as the non-followers of Jesus do. When we turn from our sin, place our faith in Jesus Christ, when we repent and follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit, He comes to live within us. We are reborn. We're a new humanity, a new creation. So it makes sense as a new creation, a new creation, we look and we act different. We should look different. Our lives should change. We shouldn't look the same. Our story should be reshaped. Paul, Paul here is saying the Jesus plus plan is a no-go. It's a no-go. And the Jesus plus plan is that idea of, of continuing to be the same person and just adding a little bit of Jesus. I'm just going to Jesus plus my life. Basically not really changing anything, just adding a little bit of Jesus to my life, right? Paul says he testifies in the Lord that the Jesus plus plan isn't an option. Right out of the gate, I feel Paul challenging, challenging me. I feel challenged by our verses this morning. Often, I, to be transparent, I don't want to be different. I don't want to be reshaped. I want to watch the same things. I want to listen to the same stuff. I want to go to the same places. I want to say the same things. I want to gossip the same way. I want to self-promote the same. I want to spend money the same. I want to eat, drink, be merry. Just come to church, stop cussing, and call it saved. But, I, but look closely. I want you to look closely at verse 17. Now this I say and testify. Some Bibles translate testify in, as in, insist. So Paul says, I say and and testify or insist, and then he invokes the reasoning for, the authority for which he speaks. He says, in the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul says his basis for this authority, the authority to tell Christians of, of, of Ephesus and us as well, to no longer conduct your life as those who don't follow Jesus do. That authority to do that comes from God. And, and, And here's... One of the most challenging, I think this whole thing is challenging, but here's one of the most challenging things. If you're anything like me, there's, a, there's probably been a time in your life where you've looked at someone, you've seen what someone has done, you've heard about what somebody said, and you look at them and you go, and they call themselves a Christian. Right? We've seen something, we've heard something, we've experienced something, and it doesn't line up with the face faith that that person professes. And the, the hard part about our text this morning is Paul isn't asking us to assess others. We've seen something, we've heard something, we've experienced something, and it doesn't line up with the faith that that person professes. And the whole time we're looking in the mirror. The whole time we're looking in the mirror. While it's easy to sit here and think of a, the other person who needs to hear this, Paul Paul is talking about me, and Paul is talking about you. As followers of Jesus, our lives should look different. Look at it again, verse 17. I'll move faster as we go along, but look at verse 17 again. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to, the heart, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given, given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Paul talks about both the mind and the heart, both the mind and the heart of the Gentiles, those who don't follow Jesus Christ. And I want to talk about this phrase, futility of the mind. Futile, it means something that doesn't accomplish the thing that it was meant to accomplish. When I was in high school with those awesome long shorts on, I, I bought these things called strength shoes. And strength shoes, they've got this platform at the toe, so it lifts you up, and so your, your, your heels don't really touch the form. So you're always up on your toes, and it was supposed to strengthen your calves and your tendons and your muscles so you could jump real high and you could dunk on people. I'm here to tell you that strength shoes were futile, <laughs> right? They didn't accomplish the thing that they were meant to accomplish. Paul says that the Gentiles' mind, their, their mental understanding of the truth is, is futile. It doesn't accomplish the thing it's meant to accomplish. In sin, apart from Jesus, our, 
our understanding, our understanding is darkened. Without Jesus, we're ignorant of the truth, alienated from the life of God because of sin. And I think it's really possible that as Paul writes these words, he's, he's almost writing autobiographically, right? Remembering himself before he had an encounter with Jesus, right? There, he was once an unbelieving but brilliant scholar of the Bible, a brilliant scholar of Jewish history. He probably thought of himself as enlightened. Yet only after an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus where he was blinded, only then did Paul come to see that he had been walking in utter darkness and in Christ, he, only then and now walking in Christ is he walking in the light. Paul is saying that apart from Christ, sin produces a malfunction of the mind. Paul writes that this blindness, this, this, this darkened understanding is due to a hardness of heart. He says that their hearts have become callous, which results in sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. I really appreciate the use of Paul's word, word of callous here. It, I find it particularly helpful. When I work with my hands throughout the summer months, right, I get calluses, right? My hands toughen up. But early spring, when I'm in the garden or if I'm cleaning my wife's uh, horse stalls, right, I, I get blisters. They're, my hands are painful and they're very sensitive. But late in the summer, I don't feel that pain. I don't feel that sensitivity on my hands. By late summer, I've built up calluses to, to shield me from the pain, to shield me from that sensitivity on my hands. Paul here is saying that those apart from Jesus, the Gentiles, have a hard heart and are callous, growing insensitive to the dangers of sensuality and impurity. Their minds have not only been affected, their hearts have been affected as well. This morning, Paul, he paints a, a, a bleak picture of those without Christ. He paints a, a bleak picture of those without pr Christ, and Paul's contrasting a life without Christ with the life that we talked about last week with Jesus. We have love and, and unity and diversity, and we're growing in maturity, and without Him, we're left in the dark just chasing the wind. Look at verse 20. We get, another, we get another but. But God in, in Ephesians 2.4, but now, Ephesians 2.13, the buts are great in, in Ephesians. Kind of just heard that as I said it, so I apologize for that. Um, but verse, oh, here we go again. Verse 20, I'll just go there. But this is not the way you learned Christ. All of those things, then he says to the believers in Ephesus, but this is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul describes the coming to follow Jesus here with, with what I think are two images, and the first image is a school. Look at verses 20 and 21 again. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. Learned and taught. We get this image of a school. And Jesus is the subject of this image. Jesus is the subject of this school. Paul says you learned Christ. When we become a Christian, we don't simply learn facts about Jesus. We learn Jesus. We develop a relationship in Him, with Him. It's not just a, a, a recitation of facts that we know, but we know Him. And, it's, and you can see it's been a long time since Paul's been to the church that he planted in Ephesus, right? He knew false teaching would enter this school, would, would, would enter this church. So here he notes the necessity of hearing the real Jesus. Assuming that you have heard about Him, and we're taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. To respond to the good news of Jesus, friends, we must hear the good news of Jesus. Paul writes in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Jesus is the subject of this school. We learn Him. We're taught in Him. We learn that the truth is in Him, Jesus. The first image of coming to follow Jesus as a school. 
The second image is, is of changing clothes, a new wardrobe. Put off your old self and put on your new self. Our, 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 old, our old self was selfish, corrupt, and deceitful. Our old self had a darkened mind and a calloused heart. I regret not mentioning, mentioning this earlier, but the book of Colossians is a great companion read to the book of Ephesians. Really, if you're flying through the only six chapters in Ephesians, I really encourage you to read the book of Colossians. And it's a, it's, it's a similar exhortation from Paul. He wrote the letter at about the same time and talking about similar things. And in Colossians, he expounds a bit more um, on some of the things about the old self. Colossians, I want to read part of it to you. Colossians 3, 8 through 10. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I, I think Colossians helps us to understand like, what putting off the old self looks like. We're to put off or we're to take off anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, and we're, we're not supposed to lie to each other. Paul says, remember that garment, all those things, you don't wear that garment anymore. Now, as a follower of Jesus, you've got a new long white coat. You've got long, awesome shorts. You've put on a new self. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. In verse 24, underlined if you're taking notes, created after the likeness of God. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The language that Paul uses here, I think it echoes Genesis 1.26, which says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. God made humanity in His image. But of course, sin entered the world. Genesis 3 happened. But now, through Jesus, we're, we're recreated in His image. We put on Christ. We put on a new person. We have a new humanity. We have a new identity. And then in our final verses, 25 through 32, Paul tells us how to live out this new identity. We got to see how, what not to do. Now we're going to get to see what, what to do. So verse 34, therefore, because of all this stuff that we just talked about, therefore, having put away falsehood, the old self has been taken off, the new self Put on, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Here we get a list of, of the way that we're supposed to live. Like, and if you're like a, what am I supposed to do? type person, you just hit the jackpot, right? This, this section of Ephesians is for you. As we put on the new self, we're told to speak truth with our neighbor. And we've already seen in verse 21 that Jesus, the truth is found in Jesus. Truth should characterize the way we, the way we relate to one another. If we're to build up in maturity, build up in unity, the unity that's been won for us by Jesus, we have to be marked we have to be a people marked by Jesus and by truthfulness. We have to be a truthful people. We're also to, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. While we use the ESV translation here at LifePoint, I actually think the NIV gets better at Paul, the heart of what Paul is saying. The NIV says, in your anger, do not sin. I think that helps us better to understand it. The anger Paul writes about here is righteous anger. Righteous anger is anger against sin. And as followers of Jesus, we need to feel righteous anger. If we're indifferent to injustice, if we're indifferent to the evil that is in this world, then evil will prevail. As the famous quote goes, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. 
Paul calls us to have this, this righteous anger, and he gives us three kind of warnings. The first is do not sin. While we might read be angry and take it to mean now we have a kind of a green light to throw a fit or complain or seek revenge or dip our toes in a little road rage on Broadway around the holidays, right? We see that's not true. Our anger is, is to be righteous ang- anger, not sinful tantrums. And then the second warning is do not let the sun go down on your anger. It's marital advice 101, right? Go to, don't go to bed angry. That's marital advice 101. Paul says don't let anger fester, even righteous anger, I think, as well. Letting righteous anger fester and simmer can sometimes lead to self-righteousness. That's not good for us or others. And then Paul says the third warning, give no opportunity to the devil. I read one quote that took that marital advice of don't go to bed angry just a one step further. It said, don't go to bed angry or else you'll sleep with the devil. I don't know about that, but I get the point. <laughs> Letting anger fester, it gives Satan a foothold right? Gives him a football to use that anger to his advantage. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Look at verse 28. We're going to keep going. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Like with, with Quincy covered in now hiring signs, right? I think this is particularly significant for us this morning. We are created to work. Work is a gift from God. Jesus worked as a carpenter. Paul worked as a tent maker. In the Ten Commandments, in the book of Exodus, it says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Paul says we shouldn't just see the goodness of work. We shouldn't just see that, but we should also remember the need for work. What's it for? So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Notice that work isn't time to save up and just just hop on a pleasure cruise through life. It's so we can help others. It's so we can help others. I've always appreciated the way John Wesley put it. Work as hard as you can, make as much as you can, then give as much as you can. If we're to be a maturing, unified community of followers of Jesus, friends, we should be marked by our incredible work ethic and also our incredible generosity. A business owner in Quincy should turn to his buddy and go, I love to hire Christians. I love it. They work hard. They're honest. They're generous. They're kind. And look at what our text says next. That business owner should should say that Christians also speak a certain way. The way they talk is a certain way. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Friends, words are powerful both ways. Words are powerful Proverbs 18 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 12, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And then Proverbs 16, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Words matter. How we speak matters. Corrupt talk doesn't nourish us. It makes us sick. But just as corrupt talk breaks down, kind words build up. I can remember my biology teacher, Mrs. Kennedy, my basketball coach, Coach Evans, Pastor Bill, all people that use words for good, words to build me up that still have effect on me today. As followers of Jesus, our words are to build up. They're not to tear down. Look at verse 30. And, so this verse starts with and, so it means it's connected to our previous verses, right? And, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for by the day of redemption. This warning, it's it's tied to the rest of our our verses, right? All the old self ways mentioned in our text, they grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be lied to, offended, dishonored, disobeyed. Anything inconsistent with the Holy Spirit's nature grieves Him. 
We should ask this question, well, what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do, will it please the Holy Spirit or grieve the Holy Spirit? And you may ask the question, well, how do I know what grieves the Holy Spirit? How do I know what pleases the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? We read and meditate and memorize the Word of God. We saturate our lives with the Bible to know what pleases the Holy Spirit, what grieves the Holy Spirit. Let's look at our last two verses, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. In our verses, we're called to put off the old self, we're called to put on the new self. And in our final verses, we get at the why. Like why, why are we supposed to do that? As I mentioned earlier, if you're a what person, like what am I supposed to do? This has been your jam this morning, right? It's been a good morning for you. It's been in your wheelhouse. But there are some of us that are why people, not necessarily what people, but why people. Why are we to act and talk a a certain way as followers of Jesus? And I think we get at that why in verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Why do we forgive each other? Why do we forgive? Because Through the blood of Christ, we have been forgiven. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We are a people forgiven of our sins by the blood, death, sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have been forgiven, so we forgive others. I think we could say it's that forgiveness, Jesus' atoning death on the cross, that's the why behind all of our verses this morning. As we get into kind of the application, the take home, the put in your pocket and leave here part of of the message, I I think the why behind our our verses this morning is our first takeaway. Jesus is our why. Jesus is our what and Jesus is our why. We encounter these, these phrases that Paul uses to describe those who aren't following Jesus, futility of their minds darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, ignorance in them, hardness and callous of hearts, right? Given up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The why behind a life marked by these things is a life not following Jesus. Without Jesus, that's just kind of where our pendulum naturally swings. And I think our second takeaway leans heavily on the first as well as we close this section. We close it with verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Most of our verses, at least the better part of the first half, paint a picture of what not to do and the dangers of of not following Jesus. But Paul ends with some exhortations, right? He says, says, be kind, be tenderhearted, forgive one another. And each of these things is centered on Jesus. Centered on knowing Jesus, centered on learning Jesus. The old self is without Jesus. The new self is a life in Christ, knowing Him. All of this hinges on Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Our verses this morning, they're all about Jesus. And then the final thing I want to talk about is I really think this is where we get at it a little bit. It's hard. I don't know if you feel it, but I think our verses this morning are really hard. I don't know if you feel this way, but why is it so hard for me to put on my new self? Why is it so hard to put on my new self? Because I want to have this righteous anger as I look at all this injustice in the world, but sometimes I just want to turn off the TV. I just want to shove my head in the sand and and not think about it. Sometimes I don't want to work hard. Sometimes I don't want to work hard, and and Lord knows my mouth isn't always used for building up. Sometimes I'm not kind. Sometimes I'm not tenderhearted. Sometimes I'm not forgiving. It's hard. Why am I not better at this? Why am I not better at this? And here's one reason I think it seems hard for me, and if it seems hard for you, I think this might be a reason as well. You know, I I think we want to put on the white lab coat. We want to put on the new basketball shorts. I want to put on the new self, yet I'm not willing to take off the old self. I'm just not willing to, to 
be obedient and take off the old self. Many of us want to stay the same people and not change. And friends, following you, Jesus, it just don't work like that. It doesn't. Following Jesus isn't simply adding a few nice things to my life or learning about a few facts about Jesus, but learning Him, being in Him, in Christ. And here's the kicker, being obedient to Him. Obedient to what He says, being obedient to what He calls us to do. Learning Jesus, both His character and His calling, and we're to be obedient to that call. Not just hearers, but doers, James says. Obedient to to Christ's call to allow the gospel story to reshape our story. Following Jesus means being obedient to Jesus. John Calvin said, we cannot rely on God's promises without obeying His commands. Charles Spurgeon said, obedience is the hallmark of faith. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Jesus Himself in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those are Jesus' words. And listen, as we move through Ephesians, what we're being called to be obedient to, it's not about to get easier. It's not about to get easier. Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, now that you're followers of Jesus, you got to be different. Your lives need to look different. You've learned Christ. The truth is in Jesus. Without Christ, you were ignorant of the truth. Now that you're in Christ, you know the truth, and it's got to change you. Put off your old self. Put on your new self in true righteousness and holiness. Be truthful. Be angry about sin. Work hard. Work hard to help others. Use your words to build others up. Be kind, tenderhearted. Forgive others because you were once in darkness, but you've been predestined, chosen, adopted, adopted into a family of of inheritance of salvation that's found only in Jesus Christ. And moving forward, Listen, moving forward, Paul is going to tell us that being in Christ should affect the way we spend our time. We're to be wise about everything from how much we drink to how we treat others. He's going to tell us to be wise about our marriages, with our wives, with our husbands, how we treat our kids, how kids, how you treat your parents. We're to be wise about protecting ourselves from the devil and putting on the whole armor of God. Friends, Jesus is supposed to change everything. hard. It's really hard. I find it hard. And I, I, I wrestled back and forth about how to land the plane here, how to end our time together. I was up late last night, and I just want to end with an encouragement, an encouragement. If you find yourself, you'll say, I'm not a follower of Jesus, and I really don't like hearing those things about me. Or if you're like, oh, I got two coats on. Got a little bit of old self, a little bit of new self. Christ is available to you today. Christ is available to you today. Through repentance, which we did as a community. Repenting, turning from your sin, and putting your faith in Jesus. Accepting His sacrifice as yours. You can be reconciled to a holy God, not only reconciled to Him, but reconciled as a community as well. And the beautiful thing about this is if you got both coats on, the new self and the old self, we're doing this together. We struggle through this together. We walk through this together as a community together. While we struggle and we wrestle with this journey, while we get things wrong and we strive towards obedience, Towards a new self, I want to give you this encouragement, and it's from the book of Philippi, another letter that Paul wrote. Follower of Jesus, remember Paul's words to the the church in Philippi. He wrote, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We rest in God's promises. We rest in His grace, in His love, in His mercy, in His forgiveness. We rest in the cross. We rest in the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we rest knowing, follower of Jesus, hear this, we rest in knowing that He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ.